Hey everybody, Ryan Ripley here. Agile for Humans is part of the Agile Podcast Network, and one of the other podcasts in the network is the Deliver It Cast with Corey Bryan. Corey had me on this week to talk about no estimates, product ownership, and how these two topics go hand in hand. It was a really fun conversation. I'm sharing it here, first of all, because I think many of you will find this conversation interesting, but secondly, uh, the Deliver It Cast is just a really good podcast about product ownership and, and product-centric agility. I think many of you might find it interesting uh, please do check it out. Corey puts out a, a really good podcast. Uh, I enjoy listening to it. I think many of you will too. Uh, with that said, here is my appearance on the, the Deliver It cast with Corey Bryan. Uh, you know, as, as always, everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing. And uh, I hope you really enjoy this. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Deliver It. This is your Agile Product Owners Podcast. My name is Corey Bryan, and today is a hot day, and it's good that it's a hot day because I've been on fire with a couple of recent things we did. I just recently did a presentation for a hackathon that we did at our company um, that turned out pretty good, and I also did a presentation on prioritization, uh, which hopefully I'll have up uh, on YouTube in a little bit um, with some audio. Um, I was trying an experiment, uh, and the experiment, I think, went badly. I had somebody throw a monkey at me every time I said the word but. Uh, that turned out to be something where there were monkeys flying all over the place, um, and it was something that I would not do again. So if you're looking for a verbal tick, I would suggest you not do that, unless you're really confident at it. Uh, and today, I'm very excited because we have a guest. Uh, my guest today is an Agile coach and a conference speaker. He's also the host of the most popular Agile podcast that there is, Agile for Humans. His name is Ryan Ripley. Hi, Ryan. Hey, Corey. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you for joining us on this lovely uh, sweltering day. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm always happy to, uh, to come on one of our, my fellow uh, Agile Podcast Network uh, shows and uh, help out. So super happy to be here and real excited to, uh, to meet your audience. That's right. So Ryan and I, are our shows are both on the Agile Podcast Network, along with Metacast, uh, Agile Coffee, uh, the Scrum Master's toolkit and a bunch of other shows. So uh, if you like uh, what Ryan and I have, then there's lots of others to listen to as well. So a couple things before we get into the main topic that Ryan's here to talk about. Uh, a couple articles I read this week. Uh, one was by Matthew Huser, who says, uh, why don't your execs get agile and what you can do about it? So a couple things about why people or executives are having trouble with agile. Um, one of the ideas is that they think the Agile is based on teams and not company. So they're not seeing that as a co complete cultural shift. They're seeing it only as a team shift, which is bad. Uh, the training is at the team level. So again, they're not getting kind of executive level training or what types of training would be useful for them. They're only getting the basics that a team would normally do. That's somewhat useful, but it's not really the level that they're needing at. Uh, they like the, uh, one of the things that he says is that a waterfall hides the inefficiencies that they're so used to from executives and waterfall or agile really exposes those. So they like the, sometimes they like the fact that they can hide those inefficiency in a waterfall process. Uh, it can't be installed. So it's not something you can pay for and walk away and it's done. It has to be something that's involved, especially at the leadership and executive level. And that it does uh, follow, you know, it does allow you to find that bottleneck. Um, the worst cause, the worst root cause problem is something you're looking for, and then you try to address it. Again, bottlenecks. Um, each one of those things could be a bottleneck. And then, you know, you try to address that and then move to the next one. So execs not getting agile. There's a couple reasons why. That's what Matthew thinks. Um, Ryan, I'm curious, when you see execs not getting agile, what usually is it for you? Yeah, you know, it's it's an interesting problem. It's one that uh, every conference talk I give, every workshop I do, I get some variant of this question. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it comes down to a few things. I think when you look at the manifesto, the Agile manifesto itself, management was left out. And so I think that's an issue. Um, I also think when you look at things like the, the Scrum Guide and other documentation, management's typically uh, not included and it's not inclusive. And so I think part of it is that when they look at what we're trying to install, they don't see themselves, and so they don't see a future for themselves. And so I think that's a, that's a huge gap. Um, I think the other part is that when you mm -hmm. put Scrum or, or another framework in place, it exposes the worst of your company right away. And that is so unsettling. Yeah. And, and <laughs> it, it's just it's one of those things where if, you, if they haven't been prepared properly, 
if there's not a lot of psychological safety or organizational safety uh, in place, if it's um, if it looks like it's a vulnerability or it'll show weakness or this person's going to lose face or, or however that plays out, I think that's another weakness. I think finally, you know, the coaching, it's so, you know, Bob Galen, you know, another, he's one of the co-hosts of the Metacast mm -hmm. that we just talked about. He's got some great blog posts out there about how a lot of us tend to, to coach down to the team, but we always, but we can tend to uh, not coach up. And I think that would be right. the third gap that I see. So first of all, they don't see a future for themselves. Uh, secondly, mm -hmm. we're exposing a lot of the problems that perhaps uh, stayed hidden in a waterfall uh, type setup. And finally, coaches can tend to mm -hmm. uh, coach down instead of up. And so I think a combination of those three tend to hurt us. Okay. Um, that's great. And the other thing that I finally finished, and I'm so glad that I did, is Don Rierstein's book, The Principles of Product Development Flow. Um, it's something that um, one of the listeners suggests I move it up on my list um, after I expressed my love for the goal, which I learned about from uh, one of the episodes of Agile for Humans. So I was really interested in that. I really liked Product Development Flow. It's a really good book. Um, one of the things I really like about it is it gets into the economics of product development and it gets real nerdy about it too. Um, so he goes into lots of talking about uh, work in progress limits, uh, theory of cues, which is fascinating because I see that everywhere now when I'm trying to help at Comic Cons or when I'm <laughs> looking at anything now, I see cues and I try to optimize them when people are telling me to stop. Um, so that's fun. A batch size, small batch size, which I think is really key to uh, what our main topic is today, um, is trying to get as small batch size as you can and trying to figure out a way to show or to talk about the inventory that you have in software development. Uh, the work that's in progress, the, the backlog, all the things that are in progress that are not yet delivered and not yet started, those things are inventory. Um, that's actually one of the metrics I'm using for some of my programs now is, is talking about inventory. He really goes into talking about cost of delay um, and really uh, getting deep into that and life cycle profits. Again, that's the economic side of product development and how you can actually calculate that to help you um, communicate with your stakeholders, communicate with your teams, communicate with your customers about what's being done. Um, so that economic view uh, really is key. And he's got a great quote. It says, in product development, our greatest waste is not unproductive engineers, but work products sitting idle in process queues. So when you're looking at boards and you're looking at queues and you see all the work stacked up, it's waste. That is the waste. And that's what your inventory is. And that's where he's coming at that. So there's lots of things I'm going to try as a result of that book now that I've finished it. Lots of different areas that I'm interested in. But cost of delay, life cycle profits, um, those things are really key. So um, I thank you for helping me find that book, Ryan. And I know it's one that you've probably read already. I, uh, I'm a huge fan of it. Um, it's, I, I try to go through it annually and, uh, mm -hmm. I, you just, it's such a deep book and it's a difficult book. I, and so getting through it, you, you feel exhausted by the end of it, but the math is, is fun <laughs> and you can really geek out yeah. on some of those stats, but, but just the, some of the, the nuggets that you mentioned, you know, the, the, the view of your inventory and the waste is really the work sitting in, in, in a state of that it's not being used and, I mean, all of those nuggets are there, and then there's math to prove it, and then there's a way to actually calculate the financial impact of that. And I find that when you have those mm -hmm. tools, you know, those are great things to talk to management about. You know, those are the, right. hey, the fact that you're having them have the team do six things at once and six things are sitting in the to-do column, you're losing mm -hmm. X number of dollars because we can't move the top two things across the board. That's an interesting discussion, right? It's, that's, that's more hard dollars and cents, and so I, I absolutely right. love the book. Yeah, uh, Natalie Warner was the the guest on the the Agile for Humans uh, episode That's that right. really uh, put me on to see. I'd never read the goal, and so it really? was okay. it was a huge gap. And so she was she really got on me, especially after the show about <laughs> like Ryan, how can you not have read this book? So I immediately went out yeah. and got it and read it, and that and then she also was mentioning this other one as well. And I, yeah, it's just amazing information. If if you have not read the goal. Uh, if you haven't read Gold Jet, hit that first. That will prepare you for Reinstein um, yeah. because it, it is an advanced book and it is difficult. And honestly, it has helped me go to sleep a few times. But, uh, <laughs> but it's one of those that if you persevere, you persist, you get through it, uh, the lessons just keep, uh, keep coming years and years out. Yeah, the Reinstein book's interesting, and I do recommend the goal first because the goal is referenced several times in uh, Reierstein's book. He talks about it in terms of the fact that, you know, uh, the goal and the critical chain type activities and the bottleneck activities that they uh, 
propose in in the goal, while good, they don't really apply uh, to software development. And he takes that lesson that they're trying to teach in the goal and applies it to software development. Um, and that's where the, the learning really gets really good. And it is bite size, um, but it is really good. So it's a highly recommended book. Um, and the goal, um, if if everybody doesn't know, came out in a graphic novel apparently in the last couple of months. So I need to buy that so I can see pretty pictures. <laughs> No doubt that this magnificent vessel will give excellent value for the dollars she'll be earning. Okay, so our topic today, and the reason Ryan is here, is to talk about hashtag no estimates. Uh, so the no estimates movement and why a product owner might encounter this, what a product owner needs to do to either help support it or to understand about it when uh, the team starts asking about things. Um, and Ryan's got a really good vi uh, video from a keynote that he did at Path uh, Agile, Agile Path 17, um, where he talks about no estimates. And um, Ryan, I don't want to go over everything you did in that video, but I want to kind of introduce estimates, uh, why no estimates, what it is um, briefly. And then I've got uh, lots of questions I need to ask about um, how to set this up. So I like your first question, though, in that video, which is, what is an estimate? Um, and I, I answered it when I was watching the video, and you said it as well. So an estimate is what? So to me, a an estimate is really a guess. It, um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of fancy ways to get to the guess. There's a lot of math that goes into place. There's a lot of magic numbers that I talk about in the video. You know, we right. like to pretend that that we can, with any kind of confidence, estimate work, especially software development work. And I mm -hmm. think that's a huge fallacy. Uh, the reason for that, a lot of people right now are angry. You know, we, we just took everyone's pulse up, you know, 20 percent by saying that, yeah. uh, especially yeah. in the in the product uh, product world. But if you bear with me uh, as we go through this, I think people will find that perhaps there might be something to this. You know, I struggle with the idea that teams are still asked to give an estimate, and I, I find it unbelievable mm -hmm. that product owners still believe them. You know, especially after 50, 60 <laughs> years mm -hmm. where we have, we have miserably failed at this. If you, if you pick up um, Steve McConnell's book, Software Estimation, it is the Bible of, of estimating software projects. And he even confirms, mm -hmm. you know, 80% of projects are failed based on uh, over cost or, or, or duration. And so we're not getting this right. And it's just that's not in dispute. That's fact. And so if we're not getting it right, why are we still doing it the same old ways? And I, and I think a lot of the trouble comes into there's so, much, there's so many hidden problems. You know, the waterfall world, like we were talking about, hides so much dysfunction. And when we're trying to estimate the work, it's, I think developers are good at their domain, their, their craft, and they can estimate that. But when it comes down to trying to figure out how dysfunctional their organization is and finding that fudge factor or that buffer, yeah. that's where we're really bad. And that's why we miss, because we're bad at estimating how dysfunctional our organization is. And, and that makes <laughs> sense. You know, it's, a lot of it's yeah. hidden. A lot of it's in these, these cues that you never see. A lot of it's in this inventory we never visualize. And, um, and mm -hmm. in, bad, in bad development practices, bad management practices, bad systems of work in place. You know, all these things that keep us from being able to act to estimate well. And so I think that's a problem. I think it's a problem that's been proven time and time again. And uh, the no estimates mm -hmm. movement is really, a, let's examine that. Let's ask some questions around why mm -hmm. this happens and, and whether or not we can make some improvement. Yeah, and there was a question that was asked um, when you were doing your Q&A in that video, and it's something that I had said, and then I was glad that the, the gentleman asked it, which is um, putting a qualifier on guess, which is I, you know, maybe an estimate is an educated guess, and you shot that down really quickly to say it's still a guess. And I like that, you know, keep it simple. It's a guess. I don't care how good of a guess it is. It's a guess. Yeah, it, it's always an amazing uh, phenomenon at these talks where, uh, people want to put modifiers on the word guess, and they still then they think that's comfortable and okay. And, I, mm -hmm. and I, even if it's an educated guess, even if it's an honest guess, um, uh, what experienced guess, experienced guess, um, <laughs> you know, there, there's been so many modifiers that fine, call it whatever you like, but you're still acknowledging that it's a guess, right? And right, that's where they right. kind of pause and they go, well, yeah. And it, you know, part of the talk we run through how how damaging these guesses can be. And you know mm -hmm. that it, I think there's a, a stat that I throw out that 
after a long chain, there's a logical chain of, of events that I go through that pretty much prove we're guessing with millions and millions of dollars at our companies every day, even though people mm -hmm. would never do that themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I think McConnell defines a, a good estimate as 75% uh, of the time it will be within 25% of the expected results, which to me is insane. <laughs> Right. So yeah. basically the, what it means is, you know, I want you to give me one hundred thousand dollars. Seventy five percent of the time I'll be within. Let's say you're expecting a 10 percent ROI. I'll be plus or minus 10 percent, 75 percent of the time. Twenty five percent of the time, though, I could lose all of it. I could lose 10 times that amount. I could I could double it mm -hmm. or I could make 10 times that amount. Do you want to give me one hundred thousand dollars? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, God, no. Stay away from no. me. That's a horrible yes. investment. But then we turn yeah. around and we tell our companies, give me a million to put SAP in. Or, and because I've given you this estimate and a guess and, and everything will be fine. And it's like, you're not, well, SAP is more like 10 million or 20 or 50 million. But <laughs> you understand, you know, and it's not SAP or any off the yeah. shelf. It's, it's custom development as well. It's, you know, we're, we're, we're taking this situation that we would never accept in our personal lives with our own money. Uh, because mm -hmm. an estimate, 75% of the time, it's within 25% of expectations or... It's an insane proposition, but then we do that mm -hmm. in our work all the time. And I think we can do better, and that's what the No Estimates movement's all about. Yeah, and there's a lot of people. I think there's three main people, and I'm sure you'll mention them, but one of the uh, quotes that I really like to talk about what No Estimates actually is and what it's trying to accomplish uh, is from Rudy Zul, and he says, uh, estimates are part of the comprehensive documentation that we value less than working software. I like that quote because it kind of gets to the heart of matter is estimation is an extra thing. It's not delivering value. Yeah. It, your customers aren't paying for estimates. Uh, you know, we can have, there's a lot of argumentation that goes on in the no estimates hashtag. There's a lot of mm -hmm. back and forth, but at the, at the end of the day, people are not paying for your estimates. They don't care what your estimates were. They care about the value you deliver. And if you're not delivering the value, and if you're not uh, delighting your customers with the frequent delivery of valuable software, it doesn't matter what you estimated, to be honest. Yeah. So the, no estimates. What are we trying to accomplish with no estimates? What's the kind of the key there? Um, I mentioned the working software thing, and there's lots of other things in your talk, but I'll let you kind of hit the high points. Yeah, so the way I frame it, I mean, there, it's an hour-long talk. I'm sure we can put a link to the YouTube video, and, and people can get, get the gist well, of it. Yes. But um, the way I look at it is... I. There's a lot of good analogies. I like to use the farmer's almanac, right? So the farmer's almanac is prepared 18 months in advance of the calendar year that it applies to. Uh, so it's this big upfront uh, estimation of weather, right? And uh, they use you know previous past data to try to predict future data, just like you you would in a waterfall project. You know it gets mm -hmm. published. So over the past how many ever years the farmer's almanac has existed. They did some analysis, and it turns out you're no better or worse flipping a coin to, to figure out if it's going to rain or not. So, right, I mean, you're basically guessing. Again, it's shocking that, yeah. that an estimate is yeah. a guess, right? You're, you could be just as good just looking up at the sky to see if it's going to mm -hmm. rain or not. And you'd, you could make just as good a guess as looking at the farmer's almanac. However, I prefer the Doppler radar. I love that line that just sweeps, right. sweeps across yeah, the map. And I, and I think it's great that, mm -hmm. that we're constantly getting updated information. Uh, we can, you know, when the winds shift and the storm shifts, we know that, hey, the, you know, I live in northwest Indiana. And so we have mm -hmm. Lake Michigan that comes through and the lake affects snow, the lake affects thunderstorms. Our weather changes constantly. You know, the, mm -hmm. the previous night, there could be a disastrous thunderstorm coming through the next morning. Oh, hey, it's sunshine because the things shifted off the lake. We need that updated information. And I don't understand why we would ever accept a farmer's almanac version of an estimate for a software project when we have the ability to have a Doppler radar. And that's yeah. really what I think the no estimates movement is to me. It's just moving away from this, let's figure out everything up front, this, these big massive things over big massive time periods. And instead let's do very small things, make very small decisions so we're making very small wins or mistakes and that we're mm -hmm. able to plot this out and map this frequently so that we can come to you, the product owner, and say, hey, we learned something today and this is how it mm -hmm. impacts everything we have forecasted. And tomorrow we're going to learn something new and we're going to validate that learning and validate the value that we're delivering. We're going to update mm -hmm. everything we know. And again, we're going to give you this updated forecast. We're going to do that frequently, not so much that, it's, that the overhead is burdensome and takes away from our ability to deliver, but frequently right. enough 
that you know exactly what's going on because that arm is constantly sweeping across the project or constantly giving updates in an appropriate way about how your money's being spent and how much value we're getting out the door. I think that's more valuable than all this upfront work that, that we try to put confidence intervals and educated guesses in front of and try to get mm -hmm. all this confidence and this feeling of control. You may as well try to control the weather. I mean, it's going to rain yeah. whether you like it or not. And your, your upfront estimate is going to be wrong whether you like it or not. Yeah, just pack an umbrella. Exactly. <laughs> right? Pack a, keep um, a, it's a, the, exactly. Keep an umbrella in your, in your backpack. I commute up to Chicago, so I, I always have an umbrella on me. Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like um, from what I was seeing and reading some of the material and listening to, um, you have a great podcast with uh, Vasco Duarte um, about no estimates and some of the um, communications. That's a really good thing. We'll put a link to that as well. But it seems like it's focusing on delivering value now um, with the team and with, you know, the product with your customers is what can we do now to deliver value? Not in a month, but today. What can we do in the next, you know, one to three days that would deliver some form of value that we can get some feedback on and then go on to the next thing? And you don't need to estimate that. You need to do that. Yes. Well, and it's funny, okay. that, that conversation with Vasco, I loved that. I mean, Vasco mm -hmm. is such a bright guy. Um, he really understands agile software development. There's a part in there where we talk about um, where he's doing a ticketing system in, in one of his workshops. And he mm -hmm. implements an enterprise-level ticketing system in 30 minutes as opposed to six months. And it, yeah. this thing just got trashed by, by people on Twitter and people went nuts. What they didn't understand was is that part of No Estimates is, is we have completely and totally embraced the, the, the Agile Manifesto. Mm -hmm. And one of those things is simplicity. The yeah. art of the work not done is essential. I think I've, right. I think I've butchered and paraphrased that just sufficiently enough to get the point across. <laughs> but, uh, but what he does is he has them do a paper-based system on a, on, a, on a board. Mm -hmm. And so that people understand how the work flows. Because they made a lot of assumptions up front about what they would need in such a ticketing system and software. But when they mm -hmm. actually do a paper envelope system where they're moving tickets through envelopes and realizing how work's going to flow, they find out through that experiment that they needed half of what they thought they did. So now they're yeah. delivering sooner and they're getting value out the door and they validated some learnings before they made investments into software. The least amount of code we can write to deliver the most value to our customer, that's the sweet spot. That's the win. Yeah. And it's such a hard idea to get, to get across until you really experience, you know, breaking away from all of this control these upfront estimates, these upfront requirements, and really getting into real-time validated learning and continuous mm -hmm. delivery. It's such a shift that a lot of people really revolt uh, until they see how powerful that can be. Yeah, it's, it's something, you mentioned experimentation a couple of times, and I think that is one of the keys is you're constantly experimenting. You're getting very lean in that, in that regard. And I know some people have tried to change the no, est no estimates has hashtag to lean estimates hashtag for some of that reason is to actually reinforce that lean, that experimental culture. Um, and it seems that when you get there, that the estimates, as you say, become redundant. It's just another thing that if you don't need to do it, why waste time doing it? Just deliver value. I totally agree. I mean, I part of the talk, too, and I, I apologize. I know it's when I'm listening to a podcast, I get annoyed when, oh, if you listen to if you read my <laughs> book, or, I don't mean I'm trying to share the information, too. I but I, but uh, there is a part in there, too, where we talk about Bill Hanlon's experiment at Microsoft where he took 60 projects uh, that used relative estimation. So they went through the, the burden of planning poker. Uh, they did all of the, oh, it's a 20. No, it's a three. No, you're stupid. No, I'm not. And all that, that back and mm -hmm. forth, right? And normally it's not like that. It's, there's very good discussions. They find out, hey, we didn't account for this testing and how this would be hard to mock. And there's really great discussion. So I think that's a valuable part that we can do outside of estimation. However, he took 60 projects, uh, reset all the estimates to one and then looked at uh, the variance in, in the predictive power of those estimates, and it was a 3% mm -hmm. variance. So, <laughs> and, that, and that's been validated over and over. I think if you look at um, yeah. Larry Mascheron's data from, from CA Rally, so he had right. 10,000 different product, projects and data points, and, and I think he, what he found out was that everything normalizes to a 3 uh, from story, okay. four, you're right? And that, yeah. you know, the, on yeah. a normal curve, that makes sense. So really, it, it could all normalize to a 1. Like, you can just sure. count cards. And what yeah. Bill and Larry have definitely proven is that 
estimation with a 3% variance in predictive accuracy versus a one or doing your, your planning poker, the mm -hmm. juice isn't worth the squeeze. You're paying, yeah. you're paying a lot to, for a 3% variance, which just doesn't make sense. So count cards. And, and, and I think this also goes into what we were in the intro. You're saying, you know, slice your work down, small pieces, small batches, small deliveries frequently. And this all mm -hmm. works out really, really well. Yeah, so a couple of the suggestions you have on how to get there. So assuming that you're at a on a team that is interested in trying this, you know, what types of key indicators would you look at to say, okay, this looks like something we can try, or this looks like something that's, uh, you know, uh, we would like to experiment with. Um, you had some really good suggestions. Um, small stories are the key, I think, for all of this is they have to be small. I think you said one to three days um, is kind of ideal uh, in your talk. There, there's a lot of different, um, heuristics. So uh, Neil Killick likes to, these are, these are slicing uh, methods that, that uh, slicing heuristics that as he calls them, you know, one to three days is one. Wait a minute. You're estimating. Fine. Yeah. Fine. You're right. You win yeah. one to three yes. days. If, if the work can fit there, great. Um, other teams would say if there's more than one or two acceptance criteria, the story's too big. You have to split it. There's okay. a lot of different ways that you can split the work that, I'm not going to split hairs with people over you're estimating or you're not. Fine. I don't mind the type of estimation that gets our work as small as possible. I think that's yeah. valuable because of the other benefits, the predictive benefits of small batches. I think you know, if you read, mm -hmm. um, read Goldratt, you'll understand exactly how valuable that is. Yeah. And so I'm okay with the investment there. But you know, one to three days in, of duration, uh, one or two um, acceptance criteria, you know, find the, the sweet spot for your team, but figure out a way that you can have a, a shared understanding and a conversation around what small work means to your organization. That's a critical, critical first step. Yeah, it's one of the things I've we talked about on the show a couple times is, um, you know, when you're doing your estimation with your team or you're doing your planning with your team and you've got story sizes, let's say you're doing this in a, you know, a story point scale. Uh, and if you, if you notice that the team or the team notices that they constantly struggle with an eight, then don't have any eights, right? Break it down into a five and a two maybe, or something like that. Break it down into small pieces so that the team decides, okay, we have nothing bigger than a five to take into the next sprint. This is a, I, what I see as a continuation of that, which is just keep breaking it down even smaller than that until you get to the point where you just say all our stories are a one point or a three point story. And this is what they all look like. And this is how we've broken it down. Yeah. And I actually believe every story can be a one, mm -hmm. you know, I, 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 there's, there's some steps. Uh, first of all, I never advocate and I would never advocate people walking into work saying we're not estimating anymore. And that's <laughs> not the point of no estimates. I know that there's, there's this raging debate on Twitter, uh, on the no estimates hashtag yeah. about that. And for I the listeners, today. <laughs> yeah, for the listeners out there, it's a wonderful discussion. You get to interact with people like Woody, Woody Zool, Neil Killick, Vasco Duarte, um, JB Rainsberger is out there sometimes. There's some really wonderful people in that discussion. It's very, it's, it's worth it to participate. Just be warned that there are, um, there's some flame wars out there. There's a lot of heated debate. If you kind of mute that or, or kind of stay away from that and stay with, there's some great critics out there too. George Dinwiddie has really opened my eyes to some of the flaws in the thinking, uh, that I've had around this topic and has helped me uh, sharpen some of the points. And so there's some great criticism out there. There's some great back and forth. There's also a negative side to it. So, you know, tread into this hashtag at your own risk, but I think the good far outweighs the bad, but yeah, I, I don't go into work and say we're never estimating again. That's not the point of the no, no <laughs> estimates movement. Woody Neal and Vasco do not advocate that. That is not yeah, a part of any of their materials. And yeah. so what I would say is if you're estimating in hours, move to story points. Uh, don't estimate your tasks anymore. Your work should be small enough that your tasks are that your tasks are are small enough too. Uh, if mm -hmm. your tasks need estimation, your stories are too big. Focus on the slicing. If you're using story points, throw every card out of your deck except a, a one, three, and a five, with an eye towards moving towards a one, mm -hmm. one only. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, cumulative flow diagrams help us get there. Use those. If you don't know what those are, every decent Kanban book out there. My pronunciation yeah. of, of Kanban, my my North my Indiana <laughs> accent hurts me sometimes. But it's okay. every it's okay. every every Kanban uh, book out there talks about cumulative flow diagrams. 
check them out. Yeah. Actually, I should I'll I'll do some kind of PDF or something on how to do great ones because I think it's such a skill that is important. And, and then finally, you know, once you get every story to one, don't negotiate that. Don't yeah. negotiate the fact that that you've made it a one. Negotiate decisions. And what I mean yeah. is, if a product owner shows up and says, "Hey, this new thing is the 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 latest sparkly shiny thing. We got to get it in now." Great. What are you going to take out yeah. for us to do that? That's the discussion yeah. to have, not that everything now becomes half a point so that this new thing fits, right? We yeah, don't I've, negotiate estimates. Right. I've always uh, recommended and, and seen several times where teams get into, you know, estimation sessions that we're having, uh, you know, story grooming sessions, and the team wants to est estimate the points or they want to negotiate on the points. Well, I'm an eight, but I could come to a five if we did this, this, and this. No, just talk about what we're trying to accomplish and then let the estimates come out of that if we need to. Or, again, if we could break it down even smaller to deliver, you know, more frequent things, then let's do that. Well, and, and even worse, I, I recall a project from a number of, of roles and jobs ago where we came into, we all flew into the corporate headquarters and a number of us, I mean, this is a very expensive meeting, 20 of us mm -hmm. fly, flying in from all over the country trying to figure out a very complex project. We're basically trying to estimate way too much work over way too long of a period of time, but that was the, that was the mandate. So we sat down and did it. Uh, we gave a very honest effort, and it turned out it was going to land in October, right. right? And so the the stakeholder walks in and says, "October, you're insane. I need this by April. Make it fit in, into April." Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, we can't do that. And actually, that led to some very uh, difficult, tense uh, moments. But by refusing to negotiate the estimate, we were able to actually save this project from being miscommunicated, misfunded, mismanaged. Uh, right. You know, had we agreed to April, we would have it would have still taken to October. The work sure. doesn't change just because the the highest paid person in the room throws a fit. Right. Or the highest yeah. paid person in the room has a different perception of the project than you do. It's not always a bad management. It's sometimes it's just that person doing the best they thing they know how to do with the information they have, and we haven't given them enough information to make a better decision. Sometimes it's on us. You know, I, I think Management is the boogeyman sometimes in agile uh, context, and we should. Mm -hmm. And this is part of the the problem we talked about earlier. Sometimes we have to step back, uh, be professionals, and negotiate the decision, not the estimate, but also understand that that they're operating under their own set of assumptions, needs, um, and information that perhaps we have not helped inform or influence correctly. So, yeah, yeah, I in situations and it comes up. Uh, almost weekly, at least, um, in the job that I'm doing now and in previous product owner positions where something will change and they will want something or they will want us to look at some, you know, crazy thing we can't possibly implement by the date that it was sold. Um, so, okay, what can we do? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll fall back to uh, the great Heinrich uh, video where he says, okay, we can have this by this or we could have this by this, which do you prefer? Um, and then to, to talk about that and that's where you're negotiating on this is the value we can deliver by this date and you know because we've we know or we're going to start working on it today and this is what we think we can do yeah and i i think that's that's the approach and if you cannot have that type of reasonable conversation um i would argue you're not in an agile space anyways and uh, mm -hmm. you have far larger problems than than your estimates at that point yes yeah yeah, estimates are really a, um, like you, you said in the talk, um, it, it's really a symptom of a larger organization cultural problem that you have. Yeah, complete, yeah and, and they really are. And, the, and this yeah. will cause 100 tweets to fire, fire off the same day you post this, but I do see estimates as some kind of form of dysfunction. And sometimes that dysfunction is needed, right? Yeah. Some of it, there, there's, this, there's this much bigger conversation that needs to happen, right? So now that Agile is spread to these larger, more established companies, you know, the mm -hmm. Fortune 500, let's scope it there. The investment for a company like that to go Agile is massive. But mm -hmm. if they could take half a step forward and do a little better and a little better and a little better, there's going to be dysfunction there. But it's better than what it was. And so if you still need the estimates in order to, to interface with part of the organizations that aren't ready to move to a fully Agile space, I don't think that's so bad. Like that's mm. not, we're not making fun of that. We're not talking down to that. We're just saying, look, the fact that that estimation process still exists instead of 
continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous feedback, small batches, small decisions, small wins, value mm-hmm. delivered sooner. If, that is a dysfunction and that is a smell. Now, if the yeah. investment's not worth it to get there, the company's still profitable and people's lives are a little better because we took a half step towards Agile, that's great. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah. think you're going to find anyone upset about that. And it seems that the value in having the conversations, it, this to me doesn't change when I'm having a grooming session or a story discovery session with my team or with my stakeholders. The fact that let's say I'm not going to estimate something or the fact that I'm going to have all my estimates at one or something like that, I still want to have that session because I still want to have those conversations with the team so that we all still understand still what we're doing. We're just doing a lot of smaller things. So when I say the, that we've, entirely embrace the Agile Manifesto. I truly mean it. And let me, mm-hmm. let me quote this correctly because I've butchered a few of these principles already. Um, <laughs> it's on my list to, to be able to recite these a little more accurately. But um, you know, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. And so this is a must. And the fact that, that we are embracing that means we are over-indexing on communication, on collaboration. We're providing mm-hmm. constant updates. And by the way, the business people have to be okay with the fact that we're moving to a story counting, everything's a one methodology or idea or practice, whatever you want to call it. And if they're not, then we have to find a different way to work. Mm-hmm. So this is collaborative. This isn't the developers yeah. dictating. This yeah. is everyone realizing together that this is more valuable, that this gets us to continual flow, that this gets us to uh, value sooner. And if that agreement and shared understanding isn't there, then these ideas don't work. And so we have to find a different way to collaborate and deliver. Um, and like you said, the the WIP limits, I think, are are part of the key here because it lets you put this into your CFD diagram, which is something you're right. All Kanban teams are doing this. Um, I've got two Kanban teams myself, and they are already just counting stories. They're not counting points or anything else. So if you do this for your epics or you do this for your stories or you do this for anything, you can actually get and see this. I actually went back in the five teams that I have. I went back for the five previous sprints uh, and looked at it. So I had 15 data points to see how it flow. And it was, it was not that far off. You're right. It's, it's the estimates that we had. Every team estimates differently, but again, I, and I actually had it and I had this for about five years. I just count the cards at the top so I can see how many stories we got done each sprint. Yeah. Vasco's got, he's got a lot of great data that shows the convergence between counting stories and, and using the points and, like I said, it's a 3% variance yeah. is, is what, yeah. is what people continually are. And that's repeatable. I think Vasco found a similar result. Um, Hanlon found a similar, found that result at, through his work. I mean, it's, is it worth 3%? Yeah. I, 3% is pretty good. If I could get to 3%, I think I'd be happy. Even, even a 10% variance is, would turn into yeah. what? Uh, a three or four week jump. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there are some cases where that is, so a lot of the, the criticism comes from um, embedded systems in that kind of space. And I kind yeah. of, in that situation, there's a lot of dependencies in place. And in, in an environment where the dependencies are very high, first of all, I, I would challenge people in those spaces, can you apply agility truly to a, a domain that has high coupling and, uh, and high dependencies, right? And I don't think that necessarily mm-hmm. works well. But if you can make that, that work, I think these ideas struggle in that space because with the high dependencies, you now have outside factors influencing your flow, and it, which again mm-hmm. makes estimation near impossible, right? Yeah. So let's, let's, let's couch that real quick. I mean, that still makes estimation difficult at best, mm-hmm. um, but it also will make continual flow, uh, small batches, small story sizing uh, difficult as well because it will impact throughput which is yeah. really at the, at the heart of, of what we're talking about. Yeah. So a couple of the questions that I had about it, um, and you just answered one of them, which is how does this affect planning at the sprint release, the, the PI or at the annual level? It's really, you know, if you can do this with uh, independent teams or the teams are set up so that they don't have to depend on one another, it's a lot easier to do this type of uh, estimation process. Yeah, I it, totally. And, and just to, tag that that point quickly um i think there's more planning in a no estimates environment really because, okay because i think we're actually we're providing more information to you as the product owner right we're, we're actually we are being completely transparent 
We have all of our we have all of our inventory on the wall. We have all mm-hmm. of our our work on the wall. Uh, we're providing yep. regular updates on delivery. Um, mm-hmm. The cumulative flow diagram is updated daily. Yeah. Right. So you can see how everything is moving across. Throughput is recalculated. I think there's more planning or more opportunities for effective planning in, in a no estimate space than a a traditional uh, environment. Yeah, it sounds like a lot of the benefits and a lot of the requirements that are with Kanban, if you're if you're a product owner in Kanban, and I know that there's not a official product owner position in a Kanban team, uh, but somebody's making decisions and somebody's you know doing that for the team in most cases. And in a Kanban system, as we've talked about before, you are more active. You are writing stories, you're updating stories, you're constantly prioritizing, you're constantly giving feedback. So if the team is coming back to you constantly like that uh, with, you know, with feedback from clients or from themselves discovering something, then it falls in that same pattern of you're constantly busy in a Kanban type setup or a flow type setup where it's just constant data and you're constantly making decisions. Yeah, totally. I I think it it's um, I think the product owner is constantly busy, but you're busy on more rewarding work. Yes. You're not you're not adjusting Gantt charts. Uh, it's not busy work. Right. It, it's not all of this stuff that made us look busy and felt accountable or felt like we were in control. We're actually working yeah. on our products, which yeah, I, I think is a, such a wonderful shift in in thinking and in purpose. That uh, yeah. I think it's more fulfilling for the people involved. Yeah, I agree. And I'm allergic to Gantt charts, so that fits nicely. Um, I break out in hives. Uh, So there was another question I had that, um, so when we're talking about lots of different things to do, lots of competing priorities, uh, of course, we're going to have one that's number one, one that's number two. To get to that point, usually somebody wants us to do an estimate of something. Uh, And this is something that, you know, has been talked about, you know, executives usually won't green light something unless there is an ex, uh, an estimate of something, um, even if it's a, a swag, right? It's something to make them feel better. And to get to that, if we're, if the teams are not estimating, how do we as product owners or as uh, product managers get to the point where they're okay with an answer that we can give them? Yeah. So it is a legitimate concern, that, that management has, that they have four or five opportunities in the marketplace. They'd like to know which one they'd like, they, mm-hmm. they, they ought to be doing. Um, mm-hmm. And cost is an essential part of that, that equation. So is duration, especially because of the cost to delay factor. Yeah. Right. And so we have right. to talk about the, these topics. I think I, what I like to do is shift this conversation and kind of turn it on, turn it on its ear. When you optimize for cost, you get mediocre. And that's mm. and that's what I what I think we end up with a lot of the times. It's uh, well, we, we're we're fuzzy on value, but this project could be least least expensive of all five, so just do that one. Mm-hmm. And that I've seen that decision play out. I think many of the listeners who have worked in larger organizations have seen that decision play out time and time again. Yeah, I want to see uh, lean startup practices implemented immediately in that kind of decision making situation. Of mm-hmm. these five projects, can we get some validated learnings about which one of these would delight the customer the most? Which one of mm-hmm. these would get customer um, the ex- excited, uh, making that, that purchasing decision? What gets, whatever it is we're trying to do, we we'll get them to sign up for that service. Let's get that stuff validated quickly. And then let's yeah. rank the projects in that order. And instead of worrying about, well, this one would be longer or more expensive, stop that. Then we decide, based on our validated learning of value, and what we think would be most valuable to our customer, how much of an investment would we like to make to validate the cost and duration side? Mm-hmm. Right? So I, I think I say in the talk, you know, it, within every million dollar project, there's a $50,000 experiment begging to get out. Right. And so let's do that. Let's spend... Yeah, do let's, it first. Exactly. Working software yeah. is the primary measure of progress. Yeah. Right? We're agilists, aren't we? So... Everything else, yeah. your estimates of cost and all that stuff is secondary to working software. So mm-hmm. let's, let's decide as an executive team, this is the, we have validated learnings about the value of this, this project to our customers. This one is number one. So now let's decide, um, a, let's say that our scrum team, let's say that they have a monthly run rate of uh, simple numbers, $10,000. They're mm-hmm. highly, highly, they're, they're way underpaid. And we know that we're we're chasing anywhere from a 5 to 10 million dollar value. 
mm-hmm. is it worth five sprints, five months at fifty thousand dollars to try to chase five to ten million? Right. I think it is. And then yeah. if you get to the end of the first month and you realize, whoa, 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 this is overly complex. We need to either re-architect, redefine, rescope, or scrap and move to the next project. You've mm-hmm. saved so much money. You've you've avoided yeah. the sunk cost dilemma. You can stay away from all those fallacies. You can move on to the next project with some validated learnings. That's all that yep. what we're really about. It's we're trying to figure out ways to get to validated learnings as quickly as possible instead of guesses, hunches, uh, educated guesses, fancy documents that really don't deliver anything. You know, we're just right. trying to get to some actual validated learnings that help us make good decisions. And, and, okay. And I and I don't think these are these are wild ideas. I just think it, it's a different change from uh, traditional thinking. But this will yeah. be normal. Companies that that decide that they're going to embrace continuous learning are going to be the ones that survive going forward. Yeah, and I think there's lots of companies that are already doing this type of activity that are really flow based or lean based that are already doing this, and and they don't have a hashtag to go with it. It's just the way they work, and they're 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 awesome at it. Um, and I love it. So really good stuff. It's the new world of work. And I, I think you see companies like, well, let's not go into companies. When I, when I look at um, scrum.org and you see the investments mm-hmm. they're making in Nexus, some of the DevOps things that I think they have coming out uh, that they're mm-hmm. starting to announce, when they're starting to really focus on some of these ideas to help with business agility, you know, business agility mm-hmm. is now a buzz phrase that, that I'm yes. sure people will be capitalizing yes. on that soon. When you see companies coming around to these validated learning ideas and trying to get to validated learning as quickly as possible, mm-hmm. um, I just I think this is going to be just fascinating. If you think about the Fortune 500, you know, 89 percent of the companies on the Fortune 500 list in 1955 are not on the list today. Yeah. All right. So they are dying <laughs> out. They and yeah. they are shifting. Continuous learning in the future. Now the the average age of a company that will not embrace continuous learning. I think I saw this in a keynote uh, at Agile Indy. There's just a a statistic flying around that uh, they've got a seven year lifespan. Mm -hmm. That if they don't, if they, if companies do not start behaving in ways where they are, they're operating on validated learnings and focusing investment, you know, vigorously towards the right things, the right times, the right places and getting value returned quickly, they just won't make it. Yeah. Yeah, that's I, I saw that same stat, and it's amazing to see all the companies that are not there anymore because they didn't do this, um, and the companies that are there that are doing this that are eating themselves. Um, that's why they're doing it. It's because that's how that's what companies have to do to survive now. So. Oh, you have to reinvent yourself. I mean, yeah. there there are um, startups hatching every day that are trying to take over your your company's business. I mean, Uber mm-hmm. Uber has let's talk about Lyft. You know, Uber has some some issues to work through. Lyft is right. capitalizing on those. But an Uber or a Lyft, you know, one of those types of companies completely disrupted the taxi service. Right. And, and that whole industry. And every company out there has someone working in a, in a garage or a basement trying to disrupt them. And they will get disrupted. Mm-hmm. It's not a matter of if, it's just when. And so the companies yeah. that are actually, you know, eating themselves from the inside and trying to, you know, cannibalize is some of the bad stuff and that's a horrible metaphor let's try a different one <laughs> these companies that are actually looking at themselves and saying that these lines of business that they're currently in are not going to be the lines of, of business of the future and when mm. they're and they're trying to validate that learning and see where they should be shifting and pivoting they'll make it yeah. right or they're or they'll go out valiantly but typically they'll they'll make it the companies that are going to sit back and and wait for the disruption I, they're just, they're in so much trouble. Yeah. So I think this is, this is something that I am on board with the thinking of let's do smaller things. Let's get into flow. Let's deliver value sooner. I like that whole aspect of it. Um, we'll put lots of links out there for Ryan's stuff that he's had, uh, the keynotes and the podcast, and also some information from uh, Barry Overeem, which I thought was really good. There's a really good article by Ron Jeffries um, talking about no estimates. So that's really good. Um, so we'll have links to all those. You know, Corey, you make a, a great sure. point there. Um, one of the criticisms and one of the concerns. So if I'm an executive sitting in a company and I'm saying, well, I hear this guy on a podcast talking about no estimates. Uh, the name is problematic, granted. But, yeah. but it's really, your summary is excellent. Small batches, small stories, small things delivered frequently. 
that's what we're after. But when you start seeing people like Ron Jeffries, you know, everyone listening to this podcast right now, working in some kind of agile way, owes their career to Ron Jeffries. Mm-hmm. You know, in my opinion, uh, Martin, Fowler, Martin Fowler, Ron Jeffries, and Kent Beck pretty much mm. uh, gave us our careers, and then many great people followed uh, yeah. and, and enhanced our careers. But you know, those guys. When when you start seeing those people talking about no estimates. And then Johanna Rothman adding chapters in her book, or, or actually her last couple of books about no estimates and talking about the, the ideas and how those can be useful. You know, and you start seeing these ideas showing up in books of top agilists uh, in our community, this is not a fringe idea anymore. These ideas will, no. will penetrate into the community. They will start showing up uh, in many spaces. And I, it's just a matter of, we're either going to decide to change the way we think about how we, we plan, estimate, and execute software projects, or we're going to start missing. It's, mm-hmm. it's, an, it's not an if, it's a when. Yeah. Okay. Sorry for Very interrupting good. you. No, that's great. That's great. Um, I love, I, 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 that's one of the reasons I do the podcast, right? Because I can talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll have uh, links to all those uh, in the show notes, and then um, we'll get Ryan's contact information shortly. But first... Uh, Ryan, on uh, Deliver It, we do, uh, with guests, we play a little game called Three Questions. Sweet. Can't wait. Are you, are you ready for your three questions? I hope so. I hope, um, I, hope I, I do well. Okay, good. Question number one. What are three apps or products that you use in your personal life? And tell me why you love them. Three apps or products. Um, yes. My Android phone is with me constantly. Okay. Uh, I, I like Android um, apps. I am a big user mm-hmm. of um, Adobe Audition because I'm constantly editing podcasts yes. and I yes, find yes. A, Adobe Audition to be excellent. And I owe, okay. you, I owe you one more. Um, Evernote is my digital brain. Okay. So I can't yes. live, uh, I, my life would be very difficult without Evernote. Okay. <laughs> yes, external brains are very handy. Knowledge in the world, knowledge in the brain, Evernote's knowledge in the world. Um, Question number two, what's the second most amazing thing you've seen a product owner do? The second most amazing thing? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The second most amazing thing I've ever seen a product owner do. It has to, you know, it's interesting because I'm thinking of all the the first, the first, the most amazing things. Um, That's easy. It is easy. (laughs) <laughs> so a team was struggling and, and uh, the second, this is the second most amazing. That's, that's a good question. So here's the second most amazing thing I've seen a product owner do team was struggling. Okay. They, they were, they were kind of lost. I find that when a, a team is not connected to the, the why or the value of the work they're doing mm-hmm. morale drops. And, right. and I, I spoke with the product owner. I said, Hey, we got to go see the customer. Mm-hmm. We got it. We got to get this in front. We got to, we got to get some contact. We got to, got to do this and uh these ideas at the company i was at at the time like that wasn't really uh something that we were allowed to do frequently Mm -hmm. this person Mm -hmm. went went to bat figured out a way to make it happen the team got to go visit a customer uh, turned everything around but just realizing and having the empathy for the team that they weren't seeing the value they didn't see how they were impacting the world they didn't see how they were changing uh lives and then that person went to bat kind of risked in some ways, future advancement, you know, kind of could have made a career limiting move there, still yeah. did it because it was the best thing for the product. And it, uh, it really turned the team and the project around. That's great. And that, what you said right there, there was a podcast and I forgot if, if it was in the last two or three weeks, but you had uh, somebody on, or, or you guys were talking about the fact that if you're not in constant threat of your job, if your job is not constant, you're not doing enough. Um, and that helped me balance out something that I'm working through, which is, yeah, I'm pushing a lot and I'm probably going to piss some people off and that's okay because they need to get through their issues that I'm trying to help them with. We are, we are lovingly dragging people a half step at a a staff, a (laughs) half step ahead every time. Yeah. And I, yeah, that was during the uh, advanced scrum talk that I gave. And that's uh, right. There was a, there was a person there who was worried about. Well, I don't want to upset people by defending the team or some kind of context mm-hmm. like that. And I, mm-hmm. and for some that talk, I was just I was uh, I was in that a was mood. Filtered. 
that was I was very very honest during that talk. It was great. I loved and, it. By uh, the way. Yeah, I if I'm not at the risk of getting fired every once in a while, I'm not protecting my team. I'm not I'm not doing the right thing. So thanks for that Push callback. Me. I yeah that that talk was uh, that was a good one. Yeah, I really liked that one. It was it was a lot of fun just to be unfiltered. Yeah, it was great. Um, and the third question is, what product ideas are you most excited about for the future? Uh, you know what? I'm really excited. So I work in the predictive analytics space. Mm, okay. And being able to see... So big data has been a thing for a while. Right. But everyone has data. They don't know what the hell to do with it. <laughs> yeah. And solving that problem through machine learning, some AI, some really solid data science... Mm -hmm. I think we are going to change the world through making sense of chaotic data. I really believe okay. that. And I, yeah. I think those, the applications there and just really finding the, the signals and the, and the noise of just the constant data coming out, that mm -hmm. really fascinates me. Very cool. Data science. Yay. All right. Very good. All right, Ryan, thank you for playing along. Those were your three questions. Hey, I, I hope I did all right. You did you passed. I passed. So, congratulations. Very you good. can audit the class now. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for letting me play. I really have enjoyed this, Corey. If you have any feedback or any questions about product ownership, you can contact the show on Twitter at DeliberateCast, or you can email us at DeliberateCast at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, please share it with a friend. Tell them why you love it. And while you're at it, you can leave us a rating and review. We have a couple of uh, questions from listeners today. Um, actually, a comment first from Florin, who says oh, he has some book recommendations for us. He says, thank you for your book recommendations. They mostly come from Azure from Newman, so you're welcome. Uh, I immediately ordered Jeff's uh, Product Mastery from Good to Great Product Ownership, and I also love the goal. Another goal uh, convert there, so good. Um, I, I could also share your excitement about the book. Recommendations from me to you, just in the unlikely case you haven't read them already, would be The Phoenix Project, as well as Five Dysfunctions of a Team. Uh, five Dysfunctions I have read. It is really good. Uh, the Phoenix Pro Project I have not, and it should be on my list. So I'll, I'll get that one on there. Uh, he also says Tom DeMarco's the Deadline is also great. Haven't read that one. Uh, regarding leadership, I'd highly recommend Turn the Ship Around. You should also check out The Product Samurai by Chris Lucason and highly recommend uh, the DevOps Handbook, Product Mastery, and Product Development Flow. So, yes, thank you, Florin, for your recommendations and for listening to some of ours. Books are fun. I'm always reading at least one book. I try not to read two because I'm easily confused. <laughs> I'm in the I'm in the same boat. the The book that I would add uh, to that list. So first of all, I agree. Product Mastery by Jeff Watts is amazing. Yes. Uh, Scrum Mastery by Jeff Watts is is amazing. Um, yes. Bob Galen, his product ownership book, is yeah. just wonderful. And so yep. if there are if your product owner or if your any of your product owners out there if they haven't picked up Bob Galen's book, uh, it's Product Ownership. It's on Amazon. Or if you haven't checked out his blog, he just has. He, I love the way he breaks down the role and just the explanation. Mm -hmm. I think a new edition is coming out very soon. And yes. uh, he's just such a great guy with just amazing insights uh, into that role that, it's, to me, it's a must read. But all those other books yep. are great as well. Yep. Uh, then we had a question from Yolanda who says, as a CSPO, do you come up with a high-level UI sketch for front-end apps? And if so, what tools and process do you use? And are you the driver of it, or do you feel the Scrum dev team should do it? Okay, uh, a couple things there. Uh, I hope my design team is involved in this. Um, I want them to be talking to the customers. I want them to be talking to the team. Um, I want to be talking to them um, because I think I have, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm a fan of UX. I, I consider myself an apprentice, apprentice junior designer. Um, when it comes to UX stuff, I'm, I'm not the best, I'm not the worst, but I have fun with it. So I like to sketch things out just normally, even if the UX team is going to do something, I like to sketch out something to see what I could come up with, talk to the UX person about how my design could be better, or maybe there's something I can do there. So yes, I would like to sketch something out as a high level, maybe just as a workflow, maybe just as a couple, you know, ideas, you know, a couple options. Um, but I do want the UX team to be involved. Um, I do want them to um, work with the dev team, you know, again, a little bit ahead um, to make sure that the team could build it, or if they can build it and design it in, you know, a couple days, we'll get back to flow. Go ahead and do that. 
Um, so I really like that idea. I like to use Balsamic for any of my UI work uh, or from any of my wireframing work. Um, it's convenient. It's, uh, it's very uh, low fidelity, which I like when talking to users, because if they see something high fidelity, they will think that, oh, you're almost done. <laughs> no, it's just a wireframe. So I like Balsamic. There's lots of other tools. I've used uh, real-time board. I've used PowerPoint. I've used other things. Uh, please don't use Excel. Uh, if you take anything, any advice from me, please don't use Excel for prototyping. Uh, but even better is the Pencil app. Um, that I use with uh, just sketch or piece of paper and a Sharpie um, and just sketch away and put them on the wall and see what people think. Um, so I like making sure that that is a, a key part of our products that we're using. You know what? I, I, I'm very blessed to have a really talented UX UI team and I've, and I've had great people around me for most of my career. So I've been able to, to work with some really intelligent people there. If I'm working on that kind of stuff, it's whiteboard and, and, uh, dry erase marker. I, oh, I don't, yeah, yeah. I really just try to keep it very low fidelity. I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in flow. I'm interested, interested in ideas. There's, there's very mm -hmm. talented people who will make it pretty and proper later. So cheap, yeah. cheap tools, easily adjustable and, uh, just keep iterating until you hit on something that, uh, customers love. Yep. I agree. Very good. All right, uh, Ryan, that's about the end of the show. So a couple of information, a couple of contact details for Ryan. His website is ryanripley.com. He's at on Twitter, at Ryan Ripley. The show, Agile for Humans, which you should all be listening to, um, is at Agile for Humans. Uh, anything else you want to promote, Ryan, to our listeners? Uh, no, I, I just appreciate the opportunity to get in front of your listeners, Corey. So thank you for that. I hope I didn't... Uh bore them to death with no estimates. I hope a few good ideas came out of this for them and uh, a few book ideas or a few books to read. And uh, I like spending other people's money at amazon.com. So that's, that's always fun. Yes. But yes. Uh, no, I just, I love talking about these ideas and topics. So uh, I hope you'll join me on Agile for Humans sometime in the future where we can continue this. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll go unfiltered again at some point and we'll, uh, we'll go deeper, but otherwise just thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I hope that uh, the listeners continue the conversation. Hit me up on Twitter. Uh, hit Corey up on Twitter. Maybe we can both answer and uh, just keep the conversation going. Very good. All right. Thanks, Ryan. All opinions expressed here are mine, and you can find more of them at Is Corey Bryan on Twitter. And that is episode 58 delivered. Go out and own your outcome. This show is part of the Agile Podcast Network. For more shows and information, visit agilepodcastnetwork.com.